He's literally carrying them up to a high altitude. These tests are done at about 35,000 feet. Now, what was that? Well, that's a rapid decompression. The man is uh, ostensibly at an altitude of, say, 10,000 feet. The chamber next to him is at 35,000. The membrane between is suddenly ruptured, and the man precipitate into an uh, atmosphere of an, a decreased density. You know, this was an interesting instrument. Just what is this now? This is well, that's a human centrifuge in which we uh, tend to produce the effects of extreme acceleration or high, uh, multiply the effect of gravity many, many times. This man is signaling on a stick to simulate firing of his machine guns to show that he's still conscious. He's, he never becomes aware of the fact that he is unconscious. He believes that he continued to push that button. Although, if you watch closely, you'll see that he uh, loses consciousness. Uh -huh. Now, this loss of consciousness is due to the blood flowing down into the lower limbs, and not enough gets up to the brain to keep him functioning. Now, this is a period of amnesia. He remembers nothing about this when the experiment is over. And he'll swear up and down that he didn't uh, do that. He didn't do that. He mm -hmm. was still pun punching away. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that the ear is very, very important in all of this, so let's <coughs> examine carefully this ear chamber, starting first with the outer lobe, and then passing into the canal, and here is where the ear membrane would be located. Let's just put it in here. On the other side of that ear membrane is the inner ear, and then passing down from the inner ear is the eustachian tube, which goes down into the back of the mouth. Well, Dr. Harold, we have here a mechanical contrivance uh, devised to simulate the effect of the eardrum. This is the uh, outer canal, which, uh, no, which you just pointed out. This communicates with outside atmospheric pressure. And uh, this is normal as long as we stay on the ground. Yes. Now, the uh, middle ear, which is a closed space except for this bleeding valve of the eustachian tube, uh, contains air and will, under the conditions of uh, a descent, say, under the water 20 or 30 feet below the surface, or... Uh, from the pressure's coming in now. That's right. correct. From the, the outside. Pressure's increasing. Anyone can see that the tympanic membrane, or eardrum as we commonly call it, is depressed inward, com compressed very violently. Now, if the eustachian tube is operating as a safety valve, as it should be, this excursion of the eardrum is very modest and recovers perfectly all right. normally. Well, now, what is the other extreme, uh, the eardrum being pushed out from the inside? Well, Earl, if we... Uh, Increase the pressure within the middle ear or conversely decrease the pressure on the outside of the ear. The eardrum then tends to <clears throat> bulge outward as you can see here in this model. But only if you hold the or stop off the eustachian tube. Again, it's only if the eustachian tube does not uh, properly function. If the eustachian tube properly functions, it bleeds off the air, let's see, increase pressure out and everybody is comfortable. Seems to me the logical conclusion is that if you have a cold, you should never go up in an aircraft or go diving with diving equipment. That is correct, because a flyer, when his ears are not in good shape, will automatically be grounded by a conscientious flight surgeon. Well, that pretty well takes care of this problem of pressure. How about uh, such things as acceleration? Well, Earl, if you're going to use your ticket to the moon, you'll have to be able to travel a great deal faster than the uh, present day speed record, which is in excess of 1,600 miles per hour. Uh, in fact, a uh, speed of 25,000 miles per hour is necessary just to overcome the effects of gravity. Okay. Now, when you arrive at the other end of your journey on the moon, the uh, deceleration or braking action would be tremendous. Uh, out in space, say 10 miles from the surface of the Earth, uh, we really don't know the, what problems we will encounter at that altitude. Of course, some of these problems have been anticipated by knowing the way in which uh, certain things uh, affect the Earth, as, for example, cosmic rays. And so from that, uh, rocket ships have been designed with double hulls so that uh, the outer hull is, uh, is very thin and will stop uh, anything before it gets through to the vital inner hull. Now, what about such things as, uh, oh, gravity? Well, Earl, now you're talking about 10 years into the future. There are a whale of lot of, uh, there's a whale of a lot of research to be done, a great many problems yet to be solved. We have the uh, pressure and the oxygen problems of high altitude bailout solved. At Randolph Field, they are presently working on the problems of uh, whirling and frostbite. Now, what's happening here? Well, now here, uh, there's been an uh, explosive decompression because the uh, a blister blew out of one of the aircraft, and the man has been precipitated suddenly into a rarefied atmosphere. He will be suffering pain in his ears shortly, plus the uh, decrease in the amount of oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'd like to ask you, how high has man been able to go up into the atmosphere? 
Well, uh, in excess of 80,000 feet, uh, 83,275 feet published record to date. Uh -huh. Well, by no odd coincidence, we have as our guest on the program, Car Captain Charles Yeager, who has flown higher, more than 20 miles, and flown faster than any other man. And why don't we step over here and see some of this equipment that he uses. Uh, how are you there, Major? How's everything? Hey, uh, I called you Captain. It's Major. Excuse me. I'm very, very sorry. Quite all right. Uh, we're interested in this uh, piece of equipment. What is it, and how does it work, and what does it do? Well, uh... Fortunate enough, people like you all and uh, are interested enough in aviation medicine to uh, stay quite a bit ahead of the research pilots. Our needs are a little beyond uh, production pilots. So here we have a T1 pressure suit, which was developed back in 1945, and we were uh, using in 1947 in the X1, original X1 flights, when we had to fly above 50,000 feet. As you explained before, you need uh, pure oxygen under pressure to uh, fortify the, your blood with oxygen to get it into the bloodstream, rather. Once you get above, say, about 46,000 feet, the rib cage won't support the pressure required to get this oxygen into the bloodstream, so this uh, T1 pressure suit was devised. Now, on the leg, we carry a bailout bottle down here, which is not on this particular suit. It makes the uh, suit self-sustaining. You can bail out of the airplane even at 100,000 feet, and it will uh, take care of you until you get down to 40,000 feet where you don't need reinforcement for your lungs. It's automatically inflated by an aneroid cell, there are caps and tubes here that would run up each arm, down the back, and the legs uh, inflate. That pulls these straps very tight, and it reinforces the body all over to keep uh, rupt from rupturing from the real high breathing pressures that have to go into your lungs. On top, as you see, is the uh, a crash helmet, which is more or less for protection and reinforcement. Uh, here in the visor, we have small filament wires to keep the glass heated, to keep it from frosting up, since it's very cold on the outside and your hot breath on the inside would frost it up. And the face piece, as you can see, is removable for pilot comfort. It's snapped on and pressurized uh, from the time you get in the airplane. And since you have quite a bit of pressure under your, uh, on your neck and on the head, this uh, strap here and the cable that go on each side of the helmet keep from uh, more or less stretching your neck when you inflate your suit. Now, this suit we use like a parachute. Uh, there's no, no need to wear it around inflated if you have a pressurized cockpit, but if you should uh, happen to lose a canopy, which we did in the uh, uh, one of our research airplanes at above 70,000 feet, then that's the only thing that can save your neck. Mm -hmm. And we're very fortunate in uh, having, I'll cover this as the radio, and we have the microphone uh, Oh, that's here. the microphone and, right yes, there. Yes, mm -hmm. he talks, and also your headset is on the inside of the helmet. And everything else is more or less uh, just like a normal flying suit, you have incorporated inside a G-suit, which uh, takes care of high uh, accelerations. And uh, there again, we're very fortunate in having people who look uh, that far ahead of uh, the requirements of pilots, both in pressure suits and in a G-suits, and uh, they're doing a lot of study now on uh, gravity-free flights, so it makes it uh, very, uh, uh, makes a man feel pretty good when you're doing research flying to know that they're looking that far ahead of you. One thing I'd like to ask you very quickly, our time is short, how fast have you been able to fly, or how fast can you tell us? Well, we've been up to around 1,650 mile an hour in the X-1A. Mm -hmm. That was last December. Oh, last December. Well, thanks very much for coming here to demonstrate this equipment, uh, Major Yeager and uh, Bill. <laughs> how are you? And where's Dr. Lawrence here? How are you, sir? And uh, we want to thank you very much for bringing all these things into the laboratory to demonstrate for us. Thank you, uh, Major, for coming. Now, uh, well, and you. we'll be back in just a moment. <coughs> Our animal of the week is the angelfish, sometimes called the scalaire. Now these are fairly old fish. They're about three years old at the present time. They are one of the more popular tropical fishes, and we often get quite a number of inquiries as to what you should do to keep these alive and what you can do to keep them so that you will have some offspring. Well, now the scalaire likes to spawn perhaps on uh, broad leaf plants, such as this one we have here. Or some people say that you should use a piece of slate as this, and there are some who swear by lamp uh, glasses such as this. Now, whatever you do, however, you will find that after the eggs are deposited on the spawning surface, that very quickly the youngsters hatch. And over in this end tank down here, we have some 10-day-old uh, scalaires. They're very, very little fellows. For the first two days after they are hatched, they remain with their heads attached to uh, whatever they happen to be on, and they wiggle their tails. Six weeks, they're about this size, very cute little fellows and very, very nice. They have to have quite small food. About 12 months, they have reached this size. 
as you can see, they're about half grown. And finally, in a period of two or three years, they achieve the giant size that we see here. Now, as to food, you can feed them all sorts of things, dry food, or perhaps you can feed them, if you have it available, such things as a brine shrimp. Now, we'll see, they may discover that those shrimp are there and suddenly come up after them. Uh, to keep fish such as this, you have to have the proper temperature. In other words, about 75 degrees, and if you want to spawn them, uh, then you have to keep them at a little bit higher temperature and increase their food supply. Very, very beautiful fish. This is the angelfish, sometimes called a scalaire. And we'll have to take these fellows back and put them in their regular tank at Steinhardt Aquarium. Perhaps you're wondering about this. This is one of the friendly snakes. And that is the type of snake that we will talk about on our next program. When is our special guest? We will have Dr. Robert Stebbins from the University of California. Friendly snakes, their value to mankind. It's a very, very important thing, and we hope that you will plan to be with us then. Thanks very much. You have just seen another in the fascinating television series, Science in Action. Science in Action is produced by the California Academy of Sciences under the supervision of Dr. Robert C. Miller. <laughs>